Hello and welcome back to the Evolution of Medicine news video cast. I'm your host, James Maskell, and it is Saturday, the 2nd of April. And each week we look at the news uh, for our practitioner community. And uh, I'm back here with my uh, partner, Gabe Hoffman. Welcome, Gabe. Hey, James. Good to be here. Always good to have you here on the news. It's going to be an exciting week. And um, thanks so much to our sponsors, Embody360, for sponsoring this news video cast. Uh, check out goevomed.com slash Embody, and you can start to um, play with their new technology that's going to really change the game as it comes to uh, creating and helping patients to be adherent to uh, your particular plans. Uh, you can do active tracking, passive tracking. You can have connection through the app. You can see what you your patients are doing in between appointments. Gone are the days of the food diary and uh, Embody360 is the new way to do that in a completely awesome digital way. So thanks uh, to them for sponsoring. So last week we had John Weeks on the news and one of the things we talked about was this sort of multi-pronged approach um, that our community was offering to the problem of opioid addiction, which is a huge problem in America so, and all over the world and something that Obama really wants to do something about. So he's got this whole new plan uh, to be able to use non-opioid alternatives uh, to um, you know, uh, for, for pain relief. So chiropractors, acupuncturists, naturopaths were getting involved to say, hey, we've got some solutions. Now, it's really interesting. I, I was uh, the first story. It's not really a story that we bring, but I was in New York last week and everywhere around New York is this ad about OIC, which if you don't know what OIC is, it's opioid induced constipation. And I took a picture of it on my phone. And um, it says, uh, I've tried many things and my opioid pain medication still slows my insides to a crawl. Now, you know, last week we really just spoke about what are the problems with opioid addiction um, as far as like the actual health effects on people. But what you never really think about is all of these negative externalities, these side effects that affect every other part of the body. And I just think this is a really interesting um, continuation of last week because you can see that the opioid epidemic is a problem uh, for, for in lots of different ways, but all of it is also, you know, it's also a problem with the digestion. And we all know in functional integrated medicine that the digestion and the gut is the center of health so you can see that there are many different facets um, to this issue so Gabe you're walking around New York every day you see this uh, as much as uh, I, as I saw it when I was there for a day absolutely yeah it's on every corner uh, it, it's got this picture of a snail uh, for those who are listening to the podcast and like a, a shell that's made of the opioid pill so it's it's a very creative ad and um, <laughs> You know, we know that pain is about inflammation and the digestive system is where inflammation is originating from. So not a shocker. The, the medication they're giving you for pain is also creating uh, a side effect that will create more inflammation and more pain, which you will then need more medication for. And you're going to need medication to deal with the constipation. So... I'm not really sure how you get out of that cycle and that approach. And it just, it supports what is already something that's moving in the right direction, which is why opiates can't be thought of as the first line of pain, pain, like the first approach to dealing with pain, because long-term it's going to create more pain as well as a, a various, various other problems. I mean, that's why I like the idea of the therapeutic order, which is the naturopathic concept where you do the least invasive things first, and then you move the least invasive, least costly, and you move towards the most invasive, most costly. And you have to think that opioid for pain is invasive and costly. It costs a lot to do it. And the invasiveness is, yes, of taking the pill, but all of the other side effects that come from it. So, um, you know, I think that's the perfect example. Yeah, I mean, it, and look, our audience knows this. I mean, it's not like the people listening to this are sending out tons of opiates to people, but I would say the timing is interesting. You know, how soon do these companies find out about the government and other regulating authorities looking to make changes amongst opiate sales? Is this like a big push to be like, all right, what could we sell? You know, what could we push right now? Maybe we can create something called OIC and make a last push for all of our opiate and opiate related drugs that relate to constipation or whatever else. Like what is, why now is this, am I seeing this all over the city? It's, it seems, 
Odd. Everyone's on opiates, basically. They know that. So they're like, oh, let's make something that solves the problems of that. I mean, you know, you talk about root cause resolution, right? We talk about root cause resolution on the forum. Here's the thing. You saw Rangan Chatterjee on Doctor in the House. This guy was on like 23 pills a day of opiates. And now he is completely off, not on any of them. And, um, you know, you can see that root cause resolution is obviously an elegant solution for exactly this type of thing. Pain, you deal with the root cause, um, you work with the chiropractor, acupuncturist, naturopath to work on the therapeutic order. And, uh, you know, and then you don't end up with uh, OIC, which is obviously, um, you know, something that requires more drugs. Well, and, and, the th and again, we're, it's not about that there's never a place in time for all of these things we come across. Even an opiate ha has its moment. But the problem is these are the drugs that have been used to deal with chronic illness. And that's why the conventional model has been so woefully unprepared to deal with chronic illness because they're using acute solutions and they're just saying, take them forever. And that's how we're going to create dealing with something that's chronic. And that's where you end up with OIC rather than just like, a weekend of being on an opiate and then coming off it, now you have a lifetime of constipation because you're taking these every day. And that's the real issue. Absolutely. All right. This was actually sent to us, this next, uh, is this next issue sent to us by someone in our community. This groundbreaking technology will soon let you see exactly what's in our food. So Gabe, you took a look at this. Um, this was sent to, yeah, from someone in our community talking about uh, Target and two collaborators developed a handheld scanner that's designed to scan and read foods instantly, a target executive says the device promises better freshness, quality, and shelf life for its products. Um, what do you think? Well, look, this is pretty, this is unbelievable. This is a straight up Star Trek, Star Wars type of technology. It's a handheld device, for those of you who can't see it, that you literally put on your food. So like if you're in the grocery store, you take this thing out, you scan your food, and it will tell you what type of apple it is, what type of fish it is, what type of cheese it is, uh, when was, how fresh is it? If they're trying to pass off, you know, shark for scallops, you're going to catch them in that. It's telling you the fat, protein, and carb content of that food you're holding. I mean, it, so that's where it's headed. And the article is saying that this is imminent, that we will within the next few years, have something that will scan what, you, what you're holding in your hand and tell you exactly what's going on with it, if it has E. coli, if it, you know, so it's going to become a way of regulating uh, the food industry. And it looks like the first level of rollout is going to be higher up. It's not going to be consumer. It's going to be used by like Target and other people who are starting to carry produce and other food you know, food items and be able to make sure that the suppliers aren't getting away with anything. But eventually as cost comes down on it, it's going to trickle down to where us, the consumer are going to be able to scan everything that we're about to buy and know exactly what it's doing to us, exactly what's contained in it. Um, Sounds like food babe. food babe is going to have one of these and she's going to go to each of the supermarkets and just start scanning stuff and go, yeah, yoga mat is in this one. That yeah. It's not a uh, scallop. This is actually just someone who's punched a round circle in a stingray. It might just be like, it might just be called food babe. It's just like having food babe in your pocket yeah, exactly. and you just point it at stuff. No, I think this is uh, pretty exciting and, and exciting that it's come down and makes sense that it would be like an enterprise thing, like uh, in the supply chain first and then come our direction. Yeah, I think, yeah, look I mean, here. It's taken the fingerprint of what you're eating. Like just the implications of that are enormous. And if I didn't read the article, I would never have said like, oh yeah, they're going to be inventing this thing. But if you read the article, it's able to, if you scroll down a little bit, it gives you the, the specific... Um, uh, the, the way it's actually able to do it, it, it it's, it's looking at like the molecules and, and some really fine points of the food. And it's able to tell you about pesticide residues and everything you would want to know about your food and certainly do not trust the industry to tell you about your food. I guess that's really yeah, where the rubber This is a cool from. quote. He says, this is the ultimate lie detector. Strip away the branding, labeling, and messaging. What is this thing? I like that. Yeah. Yeah, Super exactly. Well, well, we'll follow that. Thanks so much uh, um, who, sent, who sent this in to us and uh, we'll continue to, uh, you know, to show the news of the people from our community. It's awesome. 
All right, so the third story that we have today was actually uh, delivered by one of our community on Facebook, Dr. Maya Shatri Klein, you might remember from uh, from she spoke in the functional forum uh, back in October. She had a book called The Dirt Cure, and she shared something on Facebook yesterday. Uh, the pediatric journal says, stop calling breastfeeding natural. And there were some unbelievable quotes in this. This is from Examiner, uh, but it says, um, new article in the journal Pediatric is calling on health professionals to stop saying that breastfeeding is natural, arguing that doing so gives the impression that natural parenting practices are healthier. The authors have started a public campaign to end positive use of the word natural, claiming it's associated with such problematic practices as home birth, homeschooling, the rejection of GMO foods, and the natural parenting movements interfere with vaccination efforts. So, you know, this is a bit crazy, Gabe. I know you were, you were following Maya, and we both shared it on Facebook yesterday. Um, what are some of the, uh, the things that she said on, uh, on her page? Well, look, number one, she said she was uh, ashamed to be board certified in pediatrics, and it describes what was literally the stupidest so-called scientific paper she'd ever seen. And it's in a widely, and you know, part of the, the scary part is the authors of the paper published in the widely read AAP journal, Pediatrics, recommend that you stop calling breastfeeding natural because the word natural is linked to quote unquote problematic practices as home birth, homeschooling, and the rejection of GMO foods. And she said, no, this is not the onion. Um, this is actually a well-known uh, pediatric journal and accepted and published this paper. So uh, the authors are especially concerned, this is from the article, the authors are especially concerned that promoting natural practices such as breastfeeding will harm vaccination rates since many parents who follow natural parenting practices also delay or decline vaccines for their children. They also cite examples of the fallacy that natural choices are intrinsically better including the rejection of GMO foods, the preference for organic over conventionally grown foods and concerns over water fluoridation. So in other words, <laughs> and so she says, uh, Maya's comment here is beware, breastfeeding is a dangerous slippery slope that might make women eat organic food and potentially even use their brains to think and question. And I think that's the, you know, my, my favorite part of what she wrote. Like basically they're saying, you know, don't, if you, they're afraid if you call breastfeeding natural, you might fall into other traps such as eating healthy and caring about the chemicals that go into your family's bodies. And this is a case where nothing good can happen for them. You know, for the people who are writing this article that are trying to scare us away from uh, t doing natural things and caring about our family and being proactive, it makes them look terrible. And, and it actually does more to help the cause because it's so it's just absurd. I completely agree. I think it's totally embarrassing. And I think anyone who's reading this is just like, look, this is the like nail in the coffin. Am I going to take my kid to someone that is certified by the AAP? AAP? Because, uh, you know, this is, you know, this is very, very strange. Um, so yeah, I, I really feel like this is, you know, maybe I think it's, they're really getting to the vaccination thing because obviously, you know, eating, eating organic and, um, home births. I mean, the, the data on home births is extremely strong for low risk pregnancies. It's much cheaper and, um, you know, they have uh, better rates and, you know, there is now a lot of science showing that there are problems associated with, uh, with C-sections and, you know, the microbiome composition, and so it just seems, uh, it seems like this is just sort of like a dinosaur that needs to die. Yeah, the, well, the article seems to be coming from a place of fear, like almost like they're trying to stop the momentum of some of these other things and tying, I mean, you don't have to be anti-vaccine to want to eat organic food or to not like GMO food. Like you're taking huge uh, liberal leaps of what you can connect to each other, saying that the word natural connected with breastfeeding is somehow going to force people to be anti-vaccine. Like there's tons of people who are pro-vaccine that don't want to feed their children GMO food or that do want to feed them breast milk. Like where do those things meet? You know, where is that? What are they even talking about? Exactly. So yeah, we'd love to hear your thoughts of this. I know we have uh, a few pediatricians who listen to this or other providers, you know, let us know your thoughts about this article. Um, you know, this is certainly something I agree with you, Gabe, is that I feel like this is something that's going to push even more people in our direction because, you know, like you don't have to be a scientist to realize that, you know, non-organic food has serious implications like the glyphosate, um, you know, all this stuff that's sprayed, the pesticides, you know, you literally have on one hand, you know, the, um, 
you know, the uh, endocrine society and other major medical organizations saying, look, these endocrine disruptors are real. They're having a real effect on health at the same time as this. It's like the endocrine society and the American Academy of Pediatrics doesn't speak to each other, which we know they don't because, uh, you know, that's the point of siloing medicine into different bits is that you don't have that kind of communication. And that's why holism, functional medicine, integrated medicine is on the way back because people realize it's all connected. And I think by connection vaccination to GMO and to, um, you know, home birthing and other things, I think, um, you know, this is going to end up uh, badly for the AAP. So another interesting week in the news, Gabe. I mean, uh, between these three things, I think we found some, uh, you know, interesting topics. Thanks so much to everyone who's sending in these uh, news topics. It really does help us to find interesting news that's valuable for the community. Keep sending them to news at goevomed.com. Um, we love getting new news and we look through everything that's submitted every week and try and find interesting things for our community. And also, you know, thanks so much to Embody360, for sponsoring uh, this bro- this broadcast, you know we're fr- really excited. We just did a, another podcast with them, uh, talking about how this helps to empower the exactly the kind of medicine that we've been talking about for two years, which is using health coaches, using technology, um, you know, following the therapeutic order, finding ways to really have an effective. Uh, you know, cost-effective and clinically effective ways of dealing with chronic disease. Um, and uh, we're very excited that technologies like Embody360 are coming along to be able to solve these problems. So go to goevomed.com slash Embody and you can uh, be one of the first practitioners to try it out. Gabe, thanks so much for being here with us. This is the Evolution of Medicine news videocast. I'm your host, James Maskell, and we'll see you next time.